Welcome to the Divorce Survival Guide podcast, where we have open and honest conversations about co-parenting, separation, divorce, and the hardest question of all, should you stay or should you go? I'm Kate Anthony, your Divorce Survival Guide, and I'm here to help you navigate some of the roughest waters you've ever swum in and answer some of your toughest questions. I've been to hell and back, and now it's my mission in life to help you get to the other side of this process with your sanity and your heart intact. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Divorce Survival Guide podcast. How was your Mother's Day, everyone? I, you know what? I think I'm going to go on record as officially stating that I hate Mother's Day. Even if I go into it with no expectations or low expectations, it's just, it just sucks, right? Like, does anyone like Mother's Day? (laughs) I mean, divorce or not. All my married friends are disappointed. Um, my girlfriends were texting me their disappointments. They were like, yeah, I went, yeah, I had like no expectations. And then what I got was even worse than the low, low expectations that I had. So I'm just mad. And I said, you know, I think that God put Mother's Day a month before Father's Day for a reason. <laughs> Cause now it's like, oh, oh, that's how we're playing this. Okay. Good. Um, but seriously, I mean, it's, it's nobody's fault. It's just, it's just weird, right? Like, what do we expect? First of all, I just wanted a massage. That's all I wanted. <laughs> I didn't get that. I spent it with my son. He wrote me the sweetest card and, you know, he had tried to get me, uh, something that I had mentioned in passing that I wanted and how sweet of him. He like went out with his dad trying to find it. And, you know, it's a pandemic. It's, they went to like two places and, Um, I was even like, why did you do that? God. But anyway, they tried, you know, and then we went over and we had breakfast with my mom and spent like a good portion of the day there. And then I was just tired and I just wanted to go home and be alone and watch TV, (laughs) like tune out the world because I was tired. You know, it's like, what is it? What is it? What is Mother's Day really? Neither here nor there. If you had a great Mother's Day, then more power to you. I'm thrilled for you. Um, I really hope it was wonderful. If it wasn't, You are so not alone. All right, so let's move on to today's episode. Today, I am bringing you my interview with Christina McGee. And Christina, she's a divorce parenting expert. And she's the author of the book Parenting Apart, which is a book for divorced or separated parents. And I first met Christina at when I was speaking at the Southern California Mediators Association a couple of months ago. And she was giving a talk on co-parenting through through divorce. And literally, she's the best speaker I've ever seen on stage, um, you know, in a, in a conference setting or whatever, or in an, even in a TED talk. She was, she's literally just one of the best speakers I've ever seen. Um, and I was immediately like, I have to be friends with her <laughs> and I have to have her on the podcast to talk about all of these amazing things. Um, she speaks on a wide variety of topics, um, from like what to do in the beginning stages of separation to dealing with issues years down the road. And she's really skilled at addressing tough issues like discipline differences across households, dealing with a difficult ex, high conflict personalities, bad mouthing, right? All of these things. She's so great. Her book is wonderful. I highly recommend it. And I'm just super excited to finally be bringing you my interview with her. So without further ado, here is my conversation with Christina McGee, which we had, I think, week one of the pandemic. Uh, of quarantine. (laughs) So we were having some trouble with recording. I can't remember how it all turned out ultimately, but it was my very first back at home interview when quarantine began. So here we are uh, sort of peering back into our not so distant past. All right, Christina McGee. I'm so happy to have you on my podcast. The moment I heard you speak, I was like, I need this woman in my life. Uh, (laughs) I can't wait to have her on my podcast. (laughs) Well, I am totally delighted to be here. I mean, I'm just 
what what a great connection to make. I was so excited to meet you and I've listened to your podcast and was just really loving and connecting with the information that you're providing folks. So thank you for having me here to share. The feeling is so mutual. I remember at, right after hearing you speak, and just for, for my listeners, um, Christina and I met at the Southern California Mediation Association, Mediators Association annual conference. And I, I heard her speak and I was, you know, everyone's always asking me for parenting, co-parenting information and, and parenting experts. And I was like, I don't have anyone. I know a lot of parenting experts who are not in the divorce field, right? So mm -hmm. I just had, hadn't had hadn't quite found my person that was going to be my my forever go to for all things parenting and divorce. And as soon as you started speaking, I was like, Oh my god, it's her! She's the one! She's the one! <laughs> <laughs> Whoo, boy, I'm really going to have to be on my game. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> and, I, and I immediately posted your book in my Facebook group and I was like, you guys get this one. And that's obviously linked in the show notes. It's um, Christina's book is Parenting Apart. So I, I mean, come on. How Separated and Divorced Parents Can Raise Happy and Secure Kids. Let's get down to this. Okay. And so I think that the... You know, the world is divided loosely into two kinds of divorcing parents, right? We've got the divorcing parents who are not not high conflict, right? They are mm -hmm. like, you know, perhaps my ex and I, where all the conflict was in the marriage. <laughs> as soon as we got out of the marriage, it was like, all right, what do we need to do and how do we put our son first? And, you know, we've really excelled at that. We've had tons of bumps along the, along the road. But, you know, for the most part, that's been our, with that as our framework, that's how we've managed to do things really well. And then there's the other side of the, of the, of the fence, right? And they're the, mm -hmm. these are the people who are in conflict. And I'll say that, I will say that even as my ex and I were navigating things, even though we were really collaborative, we still called in parenting experts to deal with the big things because we weren't, we're not parenting experts. We're just parents. <laughs> right. Well, how do you prepare for it? I mean, when you have kids in general, they don't come with a book. Oh my God. You know? <laughs> they don't come with instructions. And when you think about splitting up, it's uncharted territory, right? Because you don't know what to expect and you got all these strong emotions you're dealing with. It's not easy. It is not easy at all. No, it's not, even under the best of circumstances, right? right. And, then, and then we have the then we have the worst of circumstances, right? We have the higher conflict cases where people are really, I mean, the way that I kind of think of high conflict is that these are people who have not processed through their emotions and they've got mm -hmm. their rage and their resentment and their anger and their vitriol all coming out on the other parent through the children. I mean, that's sort of how I sort of think, tend to think of it, right? That, that if, they, if they were processing things in a healthy manner, they wouldn't have to continue to be so angry, right? Right, right. Well, I would say that from my experience in working with parents for like 20 plus years, it's definitely a continuum and there's a, a lot of gray in between. We get along, we're best friends, let's take a selfie. Yeah, and go on vacation together. To we can't stand the sight of each other and cannot be in the same room. I mean, there's so many different variations in terms of how the conflict plays out. Sometimes both parents are really stoking the fire, you know, and just making each other miserable. And then you have situations like parent alienation you know, where one parent's just really interfering. And then you have, you know, situations where, I mean, they say that tens don't marry twos, but there are a lot of parents I work with who just have the unfortunate circumstance of having a high conflict co-parent. Like they would love to work together, but it's, it's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. I see that. I see that a lot. I see that a lot in my work. Yeah, in my practice. Um, I love, there's a quote that you have on your website that I love that says, divorce doesn't make you a bad parent. It just makes you a parent going through a bad time. And I just think that's just such a beautiful statement because so many of us think that when we go, first of all, we think that, I think a lot of people think that going through divorce makes them a bad parent. Like I didn't, I failed. I, right, failed, my, right. I failed my children. 
yeah, I just, I was just so struck with that, (laughs) struck by that statement. I think it's so crazy that in this day and age when divorce is a fairly common experience, I mean, we've come to accept it in society, but we still really hang on to this gold standard of the perfect idea of family is, you know, mom, dad, 2.5 2.5 kids and a dog and a white picket fence. And that modern family life isn't like that. There's so many different ways to be a family. And yet we still kind of shroud this experience in so much shame and so much judgment. And to make it worse is that so, so many parents deal with this in isolation. They lose their friends. They lose at least half their family. If they had a really good relationship with their co-parent's family, they may lose that source of support. A lot of us live long distances away from you know, nuclear families, and it's just a tough experience. And when you take that and those feelings you talked about, like a failed, it's so easy to turn in and shut everything else out. And um, that's just such a tough place to be in. Yeah, it's so, it is so hard. It is so hard to, and then, you know, and then like you said, when you, when you have family and friends who are sort of reinforcing that for you, right? It's really difficult. And I, I always say that divorce doesn't screw up kids. How we do our divorces screws up our kids. Absolutely. <laughs> That's sort of my version <laughs> of what you're saying, right? Yeah, yeah. Because it doesn't have to lead to devastation for kids. Right. I mean, research has taken a look at kids in high conflict marriages and kids in high conflict divorces. And what they discovered is that they exhibit the same symptoms. Yeah. Like what really matters for kids, what's the game changer is how parents relate to each other. That's not about, so it's not necessarily the act of ending the marriage, right? It's where do we go from there? Right. Exactly. And if you can, and if you can leave the high conflict situation and find peace with each other, which is what my ex and I were miraculously able to do, then, then you've, you've solved the problem really. Right. If the problem is the marriage and the problem is the is the dynamic and the relationship and you get out of the relationship and you can continue to co-parent, you've you've solved the problem. Sure, sure. But the problem is a lot of times we don't leave that history behind us. We carry it with us. (laughs) So whatever, (laughs) whatever wasn't working still ain't working, you know, and the bottom line is two good people don't always make a good couple. Like maybe you just weren't a fit. You don't have to vilify each other to justify this decision. Um, you can still be two really great parents, but we we lose sight of that because it's a really emotional process. There's so much that's going on. And again, a lot of times we don't get that outside perspective, that perspective that's not emotionally attached mm-hmm. to help us get a different angle, look at it in a different way, step back from it. Yeah. I want to go back to sort of what we were talking about, how how, not letting go of that dynamic. When you let go of the marriage, actually continuing that high conflict dynamic through the divorce. And you and I have talked about this a little bit, which is the real reason, like what is the real reason (laughs) that your, let's say your high conflict co-parent or even you are not letting go of that dynamic. Let's talk about that. Well, a lot of times what's going on is what I refer to as this concept of negative intimacy. So when you get in a relationship, right, in the beginning stages, we are intoxicated by how much we love each other and we're going to be together and we've got all these hopes and these dreams. And when we go through the uncoupling process, and maybe there's broken promises or dreams haven't materialized, we're no longer in love with each other, that energy, that passion sometimes gets directed towards instead of passionately loving each other, we shift into passionately hating each other or passionately making each other miserable. But it is a way to maintain the connection and to keep it alive. So you start channeling that energy, your co-parent, you know, maybe 
working towards making your life totally miserable because it gives them your attention. It gives them your time. It gives them your energy. It continues to make them front and center in your life. Yes. Yes. So those ties <laughs> don't and get I, broken. I deal, I deal with this so much in my practice with my clients. And, you know, I, I, had, a, I had a client recently who, you know, been divorced for a while and she was still in this dynamic with her ex. And I, I finally had to say sort of like, what are you getting out of this? Like, what's the payoff for you here? Because, and what it was, was that we're still connected, that in some ways the union is still alive, even Mm -hmm. in the abuse cycle or, right. And this is, and you know, there's a, there's a trauma bond aspect to this, I think in many cases. And sometimes it's just, it's just, I don't even know if it's habit or we're, we're addicted. We're sort of, you know, we're primed or habituated to have our focus beyond this other person so much of the time. Well, I think it also allows us to abdicate responsibility, right? Mm -hmm. Because if my ex is kicking up all this drama and making my life miserable, well, hey, I'm stuck. Like life is never going to be good. It's never going to be free of the drama because of my horrible, asinine ex, right? Right. And we don't have to take responsibility for our lives and we don't have to take responsibility or take a look at our part in maybe facilitating that. And I tell people it takes two to tango. It takes two people to create a successful, loving relationship or marriage. Mm -hmm. And it takes two people for it to unravel and come apart. Right. And when you're focusing on the other person, you're not focusing on yourself. You're not focusing on the work that you have to do. And it's a lot, lot easier to not focus on yourself. Right. It's right. A lot easier to blame the other person. Sure. But, you know, even if you truly feel like, because there's so many different situations, so even if you feel like your co-parent is like 90% of the problem, mm-hmm. what's your 10%? Right. What's your 10% and start there and, and look at that? Because when we like get over focused on, on really placing blame and really handing over our control to this other person, abdicating our responsibility, we get stuck Mm -hmm. and you cannot live the life you want. Can't move forward if you stay caught up in that cycle. Yeah. Yeah. It's so true. It's so true. And I, I talk about this a lot in my Facebook group because I'll find, I'll hear a lot of, there's a, you know, a lot of posts about focusing on sort of, and, and almost like obsessively sometimes and perseverating on the other person's actions. And I'm always saying, I use that old 12 step slogan, pick up the magnifying glass and or, or put down the magnifying glass and pick up the mirror for like, oh, yeah. The, got to, or when you've got, you know, one point figure, one finger pointing at the other person, you've got three pointing back at you, right? And there's all sorts of slogans about this that, and I get it, right? Cause it's hard. It's hard to look at why I'm still so attached to being focused on him because it, and it's hard to look at ourselves. It's just, it's so much easier. And it's so, I mean, it's not easier ultimately in the long run, right? It's the short term easy to be like, it's him, it's him, it's him. And I, you know, I talked about what, about this, you know, within a marriage too, right? It's him, it's him, and he's doing this and he's doing this. And I will always come back to, and what are you doing? And why are you still there? If that's the case, why are you still there? Right, right. Well, we get so committed to the story Mm -hmm. that we make up for ourselves, the assumptions and judgments we have about one another. And it's very hard when you're living it to necessarily see it. So you may desperately want things to change, but just feel kind of trapped in this cycle. And that's where I tell people, it's hard to see the picture when you're in the frame. So sometimes you need help stepping outside that frame. You may need someone outside that can give you a different perspective that can give you some insight to really kind of take a look at this. And there's so many different ways you can do that. Facebook groups, getting connected with other people who get it or can relate or have some things in common. Maybe it's a life coach. Maybe it's a therapist. Maybe it's just reading a good book that you connect with. But I really, really can't 
drive this home enough for parents is put the oxygen mask on yourself. Mm -hmm. Spend some time dealing with what happened in the past and, and take a serious look at how you want to move forward and focus your energy on the things that you can control, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. not the things you can't control. And that's one of the big pitfalls. So many parents fall into when they're going through this process is they start focusing on trying to control each other right? instead of what they have control over, which is their side of the fence, right? Yep. And that we have, you know, we tend to have it all backwards. You know, we're always trying to control the other person, like taking no responsibility for ourselves, which is the exact opposite. Right, right. And I think that you're, I mean, you're, you're inadvertently doing a wonderful pr- pitch for my program because it's exactly what I do. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, you know, oh, well. That. Yes. Thank you, Christina. Uh, <laughs> is that I help with that process, right? I mean, that's the work that I think that's the work that we both do, right? Yeah, definitely from different perspectives because a lot of what I do is really just focusing in on the parenting piece. Like, how is it that you can move forward in the best possible way so that you have happy, secure, resilient kids. Because I absolutely believe with every bone in my body, it's possible. Uh I mean, they might get there a little sooner, but I've seen some parents that have really dug in out of some, come out of some really horrific situations, Mm -hmm. but really just get very focused on doing what they can, you know, really getting focused on their kids. And I tell parents all the time, if one parent can get it together and be that loving, nurturing, consistent, stable force in children's lives, they are going to fare far better than if nobody gets it together. Yes. Say that again. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is, this is why I love, this is why when I heard you speak, I was like, she's my sister. <laughs> because this is what I'm going to say this all the time is that especially for people who are in high conflict marriages, right? The myth is I have to stay in this marriage for my kids because if I leave, then there will be no one there to mitigate this behavior. They will, I won't be able to like, you know, throw my body in front of the abuse or the, you know, whatever it is. Right. Mm -hmm. But the truth is that, as you said, even if just one of you right? If you keep create one loving, protective, nurturing household outside of that dynamic, you are doing, you're doing everything that you can, right? You're controlling exactly what you can control and you're creating a respite for your children. Well, I think you're also sending a really powerful message to Uh your kids about what should you expect out of a relationship? Because let's face it, I mean, kids' foundation in how they view the world themselves, how they engage with other people, how they go forward in relationships has a lot to do with what they see with their parents. Yep. And so is that really the message that you want to give your kids that this is really, this is it, kiddo. This is what you can expect to see both of your parents miserable. And there are some kids I've heard adult children of divorce say as they got older, I just so wished my parents would split up because it was really clear they weren't happy. There wasn't love there. And I grew up wondering if that was even ever possible. Or kids repeat patterns that they see in their parents' relationships. So, you know, sometimes... That's the model. That's their mapping, their relationship mapping right there. Absolutely. So sometimes the parting is the best thing you can do for your kids. I mean, your first obligation when you become a parent, you bring children into the world is to do everything you can to have a happy, stable, healthy relationship. And if for whatever reason you can't get there, Mm -hmm. then the next best thing is to divorce with integrity. Yes. 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 Let's talk about that because I know this is something that I had backwards and that many, many people have backwards. I remember my, our couples therapist, when we were still married, saying to me in particular, Kate, what is your order of priority? What, what do you think comes first? And he named me, myself, my son, my marriage, and my mother, (laughs) Mm. (laughs) which is very telling. And I said, my son is first, then me, then my marriage, then my mother. 
something like that. And he, my therapist said, you, you've basically got it all wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what are you talking about? And he said, you come first, you come first. And then your relationship and your relation. And I was like, but, but my son, I was like, I could get behind maybe me coming before my son. Like I could get the whole oxygen maskness of that. Right. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But then he said, well, when he said that my marriage should come before my son. I was like, what the fuck are you talking about? (laughs) I was like, that makes zero sense. And it took me a long time to really understand that concept, the concept that, that if you, well, I'll let let you explain the concept because you Yeah, well, kids don't, you know, to make it, it is, it is, so okay to love your kids to the moon and back, right? Uh huh. I mean, you can love it. The, the sun can rise and set right over their sweet little heads. You know, that's, that's what we're supposed to do as parents love our kids, right? Mm-hmm. Unconditionally. Right. right. However, that doesn't mean kids should be the center of your universe. <laughs> I mean, because again, what kind of message are we sending to kids when there's no us in the equation? Like, what a responsibility for kids oh my to God. have to feel like they, they give parents their meaning in life that they can't find their own. That And we are, kids literally look at themselves as half mom and half dad or half of each parent. Yes. And they literally do. So that foundation is so very important. Right. So how are we bringing our, our best version of who we are to our job as parents. Yes. And when you, what, it, what I sort of realized was that if I, if I create a loving, nurturing foundation of, of a marriage and raise my child sort of in that nest, then he's going to be great. Mm -hmm. Right. Like he's already good. He's already great. If I create that, if I had that, now I wasn't able to do that, but I think that's, I actually do think that so many marriages suffer because of parents putting their kids before the relationship and the relationship isn't nurtured. And then they end up in divorce, which is like, (laughs) you know, right. Like what we resist, what, what you resist persists, right. You're actually driving a wedge. You're using your children as a wedge in between your marriage and then destroying your marriage. Right. Well, we completely lose ourselves. You yes. know, our, it, and, it, and it is so easy to do. And we're all, I mean, this is so important. Whether you're married or divorced, we're all guilty of it. Like my daughter, here's a great example. My daughter was looking through some of our old pictures from when my husband and I first met. And, and she said, wow, look at this. And I'm like, yeah, what do you see? And she goes, wow, two people that used to have fun. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, (laughs) okay. (laughs) Boy, that is very telling for me. I need to get with it. You know, it's like, and then you had children and it sucked all the life. And I went, whoa, 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 (laughs) whoa. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and a lot of times when we become parents that it is part of your identity, it just doesn't need to be all of your identity. And I think that that is a piece of the work we have to do when we uncouple Mm. because we have to go back through and, and refigure some things out. Like what does it mean to be me? Who am I? Because a lot of times we also find our identity in a relationship. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I know I sure as hell did. (laughs) And, and so just very basic things like, Oh, well, what kind of food do I like? And what kind of colors do I want to paint the living room? And what movies do I like? Yes. Yes, absolutely. (laughs) (laughs) You know, just kind of rediscovering who you are is such a big part of it. I mean, it, it really, really is right. And then, and again, you're teaching your children about creating identity. And I was raised in a situation where I was never allowed to individuate and self-identify. And so it really, it wasn't until I was in my thirties that I started to even recognize how little of a self I really had and begin to grow that as a muscle. And it was a very intentional, difficult process because it was not anything that was fostered and it was certainly not anything that I intuited. 
in any way, shape or form. Right. <laughs> and right, so, right. And I think that so many of us are like that. Right. And, and so it's sort of a, it, it is, it is always secular, circular, <laughs> cyclical, <laughs> somewhere like something like that. Something like that. But that's such an important point. I mean, I'm really glad you raised that because that's such an important point. And this is the other thing about making kids the center of your universe because that's where emotional boundaries can get yes. really blurry. And kids learn to be more responsible and more attentive to their parents than themselves. And they can't individuate. They, they can't become an individual because I know, you know, my parents divorced when I was a teenager and I was kind of that classic kid and became the other adult figure in the household. Right. And uh, cause I had two young siblings and I became the one that got consulted, the one that mediated issues, the one that carried information back and forth, the one that took care of. And that absolutely interferes with all those really important developmental milestones that kids have to go through. Like, being a teenager and figuring out who you are and trying on different hats. But when you step into those roles, you stop doing that kind of stuff. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And it, and this is where it becomes cyclical, right? Because you, when I don't have an identity and I make my child, my identity, then my child's identity becomes me and my child now doesn't have an identity and they grow into an adult who doesn't have an identity, right? And it's, this is how these things cycle through generations. Yep. Yep. So the bottom line is do the work. <laughs> yeah, right. the, bottom line is, the bottom line is do the work. The bottom line is that keeping the focus on yourself, as you said, putting your own oxygen mask on first, this is the thing that is going to save not just yourself, but your children. It's going to be the model that you want to be for your children. Well, and I can also tell you that in my years of working with parents, like the defining difference between families that get through this well and those that don't uh -huh. really has a lot to do with information and support. So parents that realize they need help, they need a roadmap, they don't have it all figured out, or they don't want to move, they want to stay focused on their kids and they reach out and they get support and they get good information, those parents get through this process mm. faster and better. I mean, that, that's just it. It's just that simple. But when parents resist, mm -hmm. th then that's when all this other stuff gets really, really difficult, challenging, and sometimes toxic. So what do you say to parents who, or to a parent who is coming to you, they're doing the work, they're, they're learning everything that they can and they, and, the, but their co-parent is not, the co-parent is resisting, does not want the information, thinks they know it all. How do you, how do you tell people to navigate that? Well, the first thing is what we've kind of already talked about, which is focus on what you have control over. And we also, I mean, there's this concept of radical acceptance. So when things aren't the way you want them to be, uh -huh. like you really wish your co-parent would kind of let up, wasn't such a jerk. Why does it have to be this way? Why can't they just stop doing this? I didn't sign up for this. All of these things that we tell ourselves, we are just pushing against reality. Mm. Like we are not accepting the reality that the reality may be that for right now, you do not have a cooperative co-parent. Right. That's just it. And, right. you know, you can have hope that things will change in the future. Maybe something will become different. But for right now, this is kind of the way things are, whether you like it or not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. And when yeah. we mm -hmm. move into that space of being willing to radically accept that this is the way things are, then it, it frees you up to really get focused on what you can do instead of what you can't. Yes, because there's so much energy, right, that's pushing against this, this roadblock that's like not going anywhere. Right, right. Well, it's, you're miserable, 
you're right. miserable because you are just caught. It's a, you know mental and emotional energy that you are just doling out to. Why can't this be different? Why, why, why do they have to do this? And I've seen parents like turn themselves inside out because maybe they have like an ex that's nice one day and nasty the next. And so it's like a constant guessing game. Like, right. oh, well, what do I do now? You know, they were really nice. So I'm going to be really nice. And then the next day they're really nasty and things are off the rails again. And how horrible is that for kids to have to constantly like try to sort that out? Yeah. Why is it one day they get along and the next day they don't? So one of the things you can do is focus on identifying what are your co-parenting values? What are your priorities? And operate out of those, regardless of how the other parent behaves. Stay right. consistent. Right. And, you're, and this, is, this is what I always talk about is keeping your side of the street squeaky clean. I say this all the time, right? That like, this is the stuff that you can control. So who do you want to be in this? What is it that you want to create and to hold that as firmly as possible in the face of whatever else they may be doing on the other side of the street and however much dust and shit they may be flinging in your direction, right? Oh, yeah. To have, as you said, to have that integrity. Well, and you want to be in a place where you are responding, not reacting. Right. Like you can mm-hmm. easily get into that cycle where you're just, it's like knee jerk reaction after knee jerk reaction. And when you're not accepting the reality, that's that's what happens. You can't operate from a thoughtful place. You operate from a reactive place. But you have, and, and that is the thing, you know, you always, always have an option. You know, this. I heard this story of a parent one time who was sitting in a therapist's office and they said, I really don't know what I can do to make things better with the other parent, but I mm-hmm. absolutely know what I can do to make things worse. And so all I'm going to do is really focus on not making it worse. Mm-hmm. And sometimes that's enough, right? Well, and that's so powerful when you think about it. That is a choice. You always at any given moment can make the situation so much worse for your kids. Now, that doesn't mean you have to be a doormat. It doesn't mean you have to roll over and do whatever the other co-parent wants. You still have to have limits. You still need to have integrity and self-respect, but you operate from a different place. And really, it's not based on what your ex does or doesn't do. It's based on, in this moment, what's going to be the best choice for my kids? Six months from now, will this make a difference? How about a year? Mm -hmm. So give Mm -hmm. yourself some perspective. Yeah, I love that. I love that. You have a, a great blog post. I'm totally switching gears here. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. You have, great, you have a great blog post on your website about the word visit. Mm. And I really wanted to talk about that because I just thought that was so great. I was like, this blog post is one of those, it's like the worst word you can possibly use. And, you know, and I was like, what the hell's that? I can't wait. And then it turns out that this horrible word is the word visit. And I just thought it was so powerful and so like, Jesus, of course, of course, that's a terrible word. So can you talk about that for a minute? Yeah. So, I mean, you know, when I think about words that make the hair on the back of my neck stand up, (laughs) visit (laughs) is absolutely one of them, you know, custody, possession, custody orders, periods of possession, uh, uh, uh. you know, that's all court-based language that was introduced into society and parents just hooked onto it. And this idea of what happens is that the marriage ends, but the family needs to continue. And children need to know that they are going to continue to share a life with each of their parents. And without having to pick one home as a real home and one home as another place, they visit See, because yeah. I mean, th- think about that concept. What do you do when you have visitors in your home? Right, right. You entertain them. Not- <laughs> you don't have you rules you don't have. And it's like you focus on keeping it happy and light, and there's no expectations, and there's no discipline, and there's it's not real. It's not belonging to each other. And kids need to know that they have belonging and significance. Yes. In each home. Yes. 
with each parent. Mm -hmm. So I really encourage parents to just take those words out of your vocabulary. It's parenting time. It's time with mom. It's time with dad. When you're at your home with mom, when you're at your home with dad, and really embrace what I call a two-home concept that regardless of how time is spent, kids feel connected to both households. They feel a part of both households. And that is just so critical for children. It, it is. And it's so, it's, you know, it goes into like little things. Like I remember one day I was sitting on the couch and it was not my parenting time. My son was with his dad and all of a sudden the doorbell rang and my son was there. And I, there was a part of me that was like, I was, <laughs> I almost said like, honey, you need to call me if you're coming over. Cause like, what if I was like having sex or something? I don't know. Like, <laughs> and, and then I was like, oh my God, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't say that. Like, this is his house and he needs to be able to come and go from this house whenever and however he, f and I love the fact that what had happened was he and his dad and his stepmom and, and the, the, the whole other family was just around the corner having dinner. And Emmett was like, I want to go see mom. And they were like, okay. And I, <laughs> you know, I did say to my ex, I was like, I mean, maybe give me a heads up. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> he doesn't have permission. <laughs> like maybe give me a heads up, but, but not in a way that's like, you know, you need to call me before you come over to my house. Right. Like, no, but I remember catching myself in this moment and realizing like, oh my God, even that as subtle as it may be, that's not okay. Because this is his house, right? And right. it needs to be as accessible to him whenever he, whenever he wants it. And he does that now. He, like the other day, he did it where he left his dad's house because he didn't like what they were cooking for dinner. So he went and got himself dinner at the place around the corner from my house, and he just showed up at my doorstep <laughs> with his dinner. I was like, hey, <laughs> okay, right? And. And, and that has to be okay. So there's like, there's, I think there's like subtle ways and like little ways that we do that with them. And then there's like the more grand, I think the other ways that like use the word, the wording and the way that we sort of, it, it's, it's hard. It's hard. And you're right. Cause it is the language. of the Absolutely. Law. And the other piece of that is, is that sometimes that adds to the conflict, right? Because if you have one parent that is the custodial parent, the primary parent, and you have one that's a visiting uh -huh. parent, I mean, what does that sound like to you? Like winner, loser, more important, less important. Yeah. Uh, I matter, right. you don't matter. And that's a horrible place to be in as a, a parent. And, and parents that don't have as much time with their kids that really struggle with feeling less than, losing influence, or being an active part of their lives. And parents who are considered like parents who have more of the day in, day out are often really overwhelmed, right? Because yes. they it's all on them. And I hear all the time, I can't get the other parent to help with discipline or have any rules. It's just like constant fun, 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 gives them everything. And it's like, well, part of it might be <laughs> how you're managing the parenting relationship and supporting your co-parent. Yes, yes, yes. So shooting <laughs> yourself in the foot. This is something that, that, you know, I also learned when I got divorced and I talk about all the time too, is that empowering them, especially women and especially moms, we love to think that men and dads are somehow like less competent or, or especially if we've been stay at home moms, right? And these were all the, th these things were my job. My job was to do all of the, you know, household stuff. And when I got divorced, my ex was like, didn't know how to do any of that stuff. And when he would call me in a panic because he didn't know how to do it, I would have to say, honey, I'm sure you can figure it out. You're super competent and smart. And the other option, and he did. He did, mm -hmm. right? And the other option was for me to constantly go in and like take care of it all for him and buy the birthday presents for the weekends that, you know, if, if he had a birthday party on his weekend and right. And then I would be bitter and resent resentful that he didn't know how to do things, mm -hmm. but he didn't know how to do things because I didn't get the fuck out of the way and let him figure it out. Right, right. <laughs> right. And, and sometimes you may really want your other parent to kind of pick up the ball. And so right. you might have to give them a little nudge or you might have to support them by changing your language. And 
even if you don't have a great relationship with your co-parent, even if it's a high conflict situation, you can still utilize a two home philosophy with your kids. Like you can still talk about the other place as a home. You can still talk about dad's, regardless of what the other parent does, really processing this with your kids and, and developing a framework for them to kind of a lens for them to view how their life is changing. And I think that's another really important concept. Again, divorce is not the end of a family. The family mm-hmm. changes. Yeah. And, and yes. divorce is one way some families change. And I think that's important for kids to hear, to know that the family is going to continue in a different way. And a lot of times we all, when we uncouple, we all have to learn new skills. But I think that piece you talk about with the, that mothers really struggle with is the core of that is Mm -hmm. that's also part of that identity we're hanging on to. Right. Cause if I'm, if I'm not goddess of the universe, like, (laughs) you know, right. right, Exactly. Mm -hmm. Who am I? Well, and it, it, right. And it, it's part of our martyrdom and our victimhood and all of that. Right. That he's, he just can't, and we got to let that go. Mm -hmm. Right. Because if we were, if we were to let it go and let go of that identity and empower them, what actually might that make space for us in our own lives? Yeah. In our own lives. Right. And sometimes we're scared of the void. I think that is left in the wake of letting go of those things, but we have to be in the void first before we can create a new. Yes. And that uncertainty is so, so scary, but it is, that is kind of our, our defining moment, right? Like how do we embrace and, and it is dealing with the fear because it is super, super scary. Like what if, um, what if I don't know who I am? What if I don't like who I am? What if there's nothing there? <laughs> yes. I think that's, that's huge. I think that's the, the worst, the scariest part is what if there's nothing yeah. there? And I know I had, I definitely relate to that. And that was a huge part of my journey was, was being with that void and being with the fact that there was nothing there and then having to recreate that, create it from scratch, which is very difficult. But man, oh man, is it rewarding when you actually begin to yeah. do that. Yeah. The hard work is worth it. It really is. But it, it is. It is scary. There's so much fear. But the more we push away from the fear, the more we try to kind of bury it, the bigger it's going to get, the harder it's going to get, the more we're going to get sucked in and really further away from where we truly want to be. So how do you, how do you visualize, take where you are now and really visualize where you want to be and what's going to help you get there? Mm, mm, Yep. So powerful. And know that it's possible for you to get there, even if you're the only one who's committed to it. Right? Like we're so often waiting for permission from somebody else to be able to create something, you know, even even in even in a co-parenting relationship, right? You think like, well, it's two people, so both of us have to no, you can you can actually set the stage for it. You mm-hmm. can you can create it. And you, you know that you don't have to wait for someone else to join you. Exactly. Exactly. And I think that is that that's, it's all about kind of claiming our power Mm -hmm. and paying attention to how we're spending our energy. And I tell parents, if you're in a situation where you have a parent that's not coming along for the ride, (laughs) it's not willing to really stay focused on the kids or is committed to the conflict, then develop your own vision. And I talk with parents in the book about developing what I call a guiding principle. And a guiding principle is really kind of like our signpost, our North Star when things get tough. And it's identifying what is your highest values? What are your dreams and hopes for your kids? Mm. Writing out, literally writing out like one or two sentences. Yeah. And you can do it together. You can develop a guiding principle as co-parents or you can develop your own. And when things get tough, go back to that signpost. Remind yourself, this is why I'm in it. This is, this is what matters most to me. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. We did that in our, our our very first mediation session. Our mediator said to us, you have, there's one question that you have to answer before we start anything. And he said, do you want to put your child 
at the center of all of your decisions or do you want him in the middle? Mm, yeah. And we were like, well, duh, we want him at the center. And he's like, okay. He said, you say that now, but, and he had us create what we call, what he called this, I think similar to you is a mutual vision statement where we mm-hmm. had to create this statement that was about basically putting our son at the center of everything. And when shit got hard, we went, he would pull it out. And it was like the most clarifying thing, right? Like in, even in really difficult situations, as soon as we put it through that lens, mm-hmm. it was like, oh, okay. This doesn't suit my agenda, but it actually serves this agenda. Right, right. And that's so important. It, it's so important, but a lot of times we, we don't get there because we just kind of jump in feet first and take it as it comes. And we get hyper-focused on where things are different, the differences instead of what we have in common. And I tell parents all the time, you know, differences aren't a deal breaker. Like a good co-parenting relationship doesn't mean that you are like in sync chapter and verse. No. Because no. you're not, you're completely different parents and, and you have, you may have different values or different ways of doing things, different things that are important to you, different rules in your household. Absolutely. Um, yep. And that's okay. Kids yep. can navigate that yep. depending on how we manage them. So yep. that's really the key. Yep. And if we're going to spend all our time fighting about it and making it issues and bad-mouthing each other and criticizing each other, well, kids are going to flounder. Right. You know, exactly. They are going to get caught in the middle. Yep. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. My, I think my ex and I took, it took a long time for us to realize that it was okay for us to have completely different parenting styles in two households. Like we were in the beginning, I think we were both trying to make each other, the other into, you know, our own image kind of thing. And then it took Mm -hmm. us a while before we were like, actually, it's totally cool. He gets that at dad's house, this is the way it goes. And mom's house, this is the way it goes. And there are things that he prefers at mom's house and things that he prefers at dad's house. And that's great. The kid has options. (laughs) Like A lot of kids don't have options. (laughs) Right. Right. Exactly. But again, that's where kind of that history piece comes into play. So if there was something that your co-parent did when you were together that just drove you right up the wall and they're still doing it, uh-huh. It's so hard not to go there, yeah, just not I, to go there and dig in. And it's stupid stuff. It's like, oh, well, at dad's house, I get to do my homework in front of the TV. He doesn't care. And I can stay up and watch TV as long as I want. Well, I tell parents, first of all, you can't take everything that your kids tell you as the gospel truth. They are such unreliable <laughs> Right? Well, totally unreliable narrators. <laughs> well, what self-respecting kid wouldn't want to try to play both ends against the middle, right? <laughs> right. So your kids maybe they maybe see if they can get some leverage, maybe extended bedtime, so they're gonna drop the dime on the other parent and see what happens, or maybe they just want to see you go off like a bottle rocket. I mean, who knows what? There's a lot of different reasons, and they could be telling you the truth. That could be exactly what happens in the other household. And usually these differences come up when one parent is trying to enforce a rule Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and kids will just lay down that card. Well, at dad's house or at mom's house, I don't have to. And the other parent gets completely derailed. And so then it turns into a rant (laughs) about mom or dad instead of focusing on the fact that, you know what, 830 bedtime, get upstairs. It doesn't really, that's great. Glad you really enjoy being at mom's house or dad's house. You still got to get your homework done and you need to do it at the kitchen table. Right. Yep. Yep. We always say like different house, different houses, different rules. And Mm -hmm. it's the same thing you would say if they say like, you know, my best friend's mom says blah, blah, blah. It's like, well, that's great. I'm glad that's the way that they do it at their house. This is the way we do it in my house. (laughs) Yeah. And that's what I tell parents. I said, you know, sometimes you need to use the grandma rule. Ah, mm -hmm. And the grandma rule is basically if your child came home and said, well, grandma lets me do my homework in front of the TV, same thing, right? What would you do? You'd look at me and go, oh, well, that's what's great about grandma's house. Now get to the kitchen table and get your homework done. Yeah, we wouldn't give it a second thought. We cut grandma all kinds of slack, but all of a sudden 
<laughs> because it's our co-parent. It's like, boy, it just unleashes the hounds of hell. <laughs> Armageddon. <laughs> there we go. There we go. We're throwing down. Totally. Oh my God. Well, I think we could talk about this all day. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe, um, maybe. Um, but Christina, tell people where they can find you and buy your book more importantly. Or okay. Well, maybe not more importantly, but all, all of the above. All of the above, what, whatever, whatever is most helpful. So my book is Parenting Apart, How Separated and Divorced Parents Can Raise Happy and Secure Kids. And you can find it pretty much at any book retailer, Amazon, Barnes and Nobles, wherever they sell books. It, we'll you you should notes. be able to get it. Yeah, 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 we'll have a link to it in the show notes. Perfect, perfect. And if you'd like to find me, I am at divorceandchildren.com, divorceandchildren dot com. Awesome. Thank you. So, and you work with, you obviously work with parents, you're a parenting coach. So this is people, people can actually hire you to come in and, ha and have these conversations, right? I don't want to skip over that. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. So I do have a, a select phone practice and I work with parents all over the world. If you feel like you're kind of struggling, you can definitely come check out my website. You like what you see. Let's talk. Let's talk. <laughs> awesome. Well, Christina, you are definitely my go-to recommendation and referral for all things. Oh, thank you so much. That's quite a compliment. <laughs> so happy to be connected. I'm so happy that we met and that we're getting to do this work together alongside each other, parallel to each other, <laughs> with each other, all of it. Absolutely. And I have loved this conversation and I love the work that you do. And thank you so much for making the world a better place. Oh, thanks. Right back at you, sister. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Divorce Survival Guide podcast. If you like what you hear, head on over to Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen in and leave me a review. And don't forget to follow me on Instagram at the Divorce Survival Guide. I'll see you next time. And until then, remember, you, my love, deserve to be happy.